Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Let's Talk Off the Podium. I have a harpist, Yolanda Kondanasis, with me. Uh, welcome to uh, the podcast. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. So the, the main question I've been asking people these days is how they're dealing, dealing with the, the, the current situation. And I know you're an active performer. You're an active uh, teacher. Uh, how are you communicating? What are you doing? Uh, your daily routine? <laughs> well, I think like a lot of people, um, my, my performance calendar is pretty much on hold for mm -hmm. now. Um, pretty much everything uh, in the first half of next year was, was canceled. Um, and so, you know, we're all just trying to, to find our way to, to figure out ways to be creative and, um, you know, keep doing what we do. Um, but, uh, you know, differently yeah. it's, it, it, you know, I, I, I often say that we're all now forced to become cinematographers and recording engineers and internet specialists and, you know, tech consultants for ourselves now. Um, I have learned more about platforms and interfacing and yeah, yeah. <laughs> things like that than I ever really cared to know. That's not really something that's ever interested me, um, you know, a lot uh, in a recording session. Uh, for instance, I, you know, I do learn a lot. I learn a lot about terminology and, you know, how to go about things, but I really, you know, I'm one of those people that always just kind of puts myself in a bubble and says, you know, here's my job and I'm going to trust them to do their job. Yeah, so, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a different feeling to, uh, to be exploring, you know, mics and, you know, what's, what, what has the best sound quality for harp if you're in your, you know, in a, in a small room or, or, or whatnot, it's, it's challenging for yeah. sure. So uh, you're, you're also an author, and that's something I realized after I started reading about you. Um, tell me a little bit about your books, maybe in general, but also your most recent book. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a closet um, writer type. That's always been something that's it's interested me. Um, and uh, so far, at least, what I've done is, you know, instructional books. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I published most of my stuff with Carl Fisher and I wrote a method book for the harp and I've done some collections a lot of my um, uh, recorded uh, transcriptions uh, through the years I kept getting requests for them so I thought gosh you know I better just put these in a in a place where people can find them I just did a book uh, my most recent one is uh, called the composer's guide to writing well for the harp and um, uh, you know that was a, a kind of a labor of love that's been rolling around in my head for about 20 years. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's a resource that I hope will help composers uh, approach the harp with a little less trepidation mm -hmm. and, you know, have some just uh, solid answers to questions that they might have at, you know, at 3 a.m. when they're on a roll and can't really, you know, contact a harpist or run yeah. something by a harpist. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, I'm, I'm proud of that project because yeah. I think it was it was something that's that's needed. There are some books on the market that talk about different elements of of contemporary writing for the harp, but I, I really wanted this one to be like a a very user friendly conversation um, and uh, just kind of like a, a a big fat you know 130 page conversation candid conversation with a harpist in terms of what works what doesn't, how you should go about this, a little bit of straight talk, a little bit of tough love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, let's let's make these harp compositions work the first time out. We don't yeah. need it to be like nine rounds of trial and error, and then maybe there's something remotely playable at the end of that. It, yeah. it, it can start and finish in a lot more efficient and idiomatic way. Yeah. So that, you know, that was, that was a fun thing because it had been kind of sitting in my head for a long time. It's nice. It's nice when you get things uh, out of your head that have been living there for a while. Yeah. Well, it's, it's great because you're, you, you're, you're so experienced and you've done a lot of premieres and worked with a lot of composers. So you know, what's needed uh, out there. And actually um, recently I told one of my um, former youth orchestra students who's now off to college and is studying harp. I said that you're going to be my guest. She was super excited. She's like, you know, one of my early books, I had her book and I'm so excited. I can't wait to hear the podcast. So um, actually uh, I wanted to go back a little bit with the premieres. Uh, uh, how do you approach a premiere? Because it's such a tough 
thing to do to um, uh, approach a premiere, something that's never been done before. So a little bit about your maybe uh, one of your favorite uh, collaborations or just a collaboration. How do you how do you approach that? You know, well, I, I, I kind of I've said a couple of times that doing any kind of a world premiere is a bit like reality TV. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, one of those cooking shows when you're given some some ingredients and, and then you put them together into to something edible um, in usually not nearly enough time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how premieres generally tend to feel. Um, but, uh, you know, probably my most recent one and and one that I'm really proud of is is uh, the premiere and then premiere series of performances and subsequent live recording of uh, Jennifer Higdon's um, harp concerto that she wrote for me. Um, gosh, it's now a couple years ago. Uh, the world premiere was, but then the premiere series stretched out over the next um, 18 months or so, and um, it was uh, it was it was really rewarding experience. Um, you know, working very closely with a composer um, I, like that, and you know, really feeling the excitement of of knowing that you know you're working, you're you're sort of helping give birth to a piece that will be. I think this piece will be played a lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I was a, a young kid and learning, for instance, Gina Stara's harp concerto, it's the, you know, big iconic piece, yeah. I played it over 200 times, it's, you know, it's really a cornerstone of my touring repertoire, I, you know, I remember, um, uh, you know, looking at the dedication at the top of the piece and and reading about how it you know came to the fore and how the 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 premiere was delayed and you know how the the premiering harpist was changed. I mean, it's it's really is like childbirth, um, getting getting a piece out there and and not only written and played once but launched. You know, it it, it it's like raising a kid. You know, it's not like, oh, here, you know, we've been given birth to the kid. That's a very cute kid. Let's take a picture and then good luck to you. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's you raise that that piece, that child, that that thing that, um, you know, you're you're helping to to bring to the world. So I, I do feel like, you know, that I, I was able to give give this Jennifer Higdon harp concerto a, a nice start in life. And I hope a lot of harpists enjoy it from here on out. Yeah, and I forgot something to mention earlier with when I said uh, an author uh, is that your your blog is also awesome. I've been reading your oh. blog; and it's great. Well, thank you. I've been trying to get back to it. It's you know my my life has so many pieces and parts that um, you know that is sort of my guilty pleasure mm -hmm. um, doing that. And I need to I need to if nothing more than during this time I need to give myself that outlet but thank you for saying that i really i really enjoy doing that and i hope to to do a little bit maybe, do a little more of that maybe the collection of all your blogs could be a book someday too oh well that's a, that's a nice <laughs> suggestion thank you for thank you for saying it well um you know we'll see where where life life takes me yeah. but um you know I, I also another project in my life that that i've been trying to to devote a little more time to in this uh in this strange little bubble we find ourselves in is uh you know some some of the earth conservation issues that i'm really really concerned about and interested in i wrote a kid's book a few years ago um on earth conservation and uh you know i've had various projects through the years and uh you know boy if there was ever a time to to try and you know for everyone in whatever little ways big ways they can to try and put their energies to um earth conservation earth preservation yeah. earth awareness mm -hmm. um oh boy this is the time yeah and time. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about earth at heart well yeah earth at heart is a, a nonprofit that i started uh gosh it's going on oh probably almost 10 years ago and and the idea behind it is is pretty simple it's just uh increasing earth awareness uh you know, through the portal of the arts. Uh, my my primary um, 
focus so far has been music. Um, but I really, uh, you know, hope to, in fact, I've got a couple projects going right now, probably a little soon to talk about um, too openly, but I'm really excited about some, some projects that involve some other um, uh, expressions okay. uh, of art and, you know, kind of a multimedia idea. So, you know, I think it's just, it, it, when, when people get thrown facts and figures and data, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's so important, and I think everybody can listen a little more carefully to that, no matter whether that's their, you know, uh, field or area of interest or not. But um, I think when you give people something that taps into an emotional uh, center, mm -hmm. um, like the arts, like music, um, you know, I know that when I hear a programmatic piece of some kind that is based on a, a a piece of literature, uh, an event, um, any sort of uh, any sort of idea or concept that ties the the composition together, that idea or event or piece of literature takes on completely a completely new dimension. So um, you know, my idea that I've tried to promote through these years and certainly want to do more of now um, is is promoting, uh, you know, what is at stake, mm -hmm. promoting the idea of, of what, what we're faced with and what's at stake through, through music, which is um, a pretty powerful language, mm -hmm. you know. So um, I'm excited about a few things in the, in the hopper right now, and I would have to say that, you know, that's kind of what I've been concentrating on since this whole shutdown, trying to rev up a few things that have just, not had the kind of time I would have liked to devote to them in, you know, in ordinary, uh, in ordinarily scheduled life. So. Well, going back to a repertoire, harp repertoire, is there anything that, you know, you've done many things many times. Uh, is there any piece that you just can't wait to go back to and play one more time? Oh gosh. Well, yeah, I, I, I feel like, you know, I've been doing this, you know, pretty hard and heavy, um, you know, in, in the field of music or any arts, really, you, you choose it young and you, you really go after it young, you develop yourself young. And so, you know, I don't consider myself old at this point, but, you know, I've been doing this hard and heavy for 40 years, you know, so, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a situation where every time you go back to a piece, it, especially those that you particularly like, it's like you're returning to an old friend, you know, bringing it out. Um, there's a, there's a sense of familiarity, almost a family of, of being in your wheelhouse, you know, and, um, there are pieces that I enjoy bringing up more than, more than others. Um, you know, I, I play the Gina Stara, uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, every time I bring it out, I try and um, I try and find new things, um, which I think most artists will tell you, you know, you can't just grind it out. You can't just, you know, have an interpretation and, you know, uh, work it up and go spit it out. Um, I think that one thing I love about that piece is just that it does feel pretty fresh to me every time I, I bring it up. And you know, what's nice is, um, uh, you know, there were, there was a good decade of my life or more, I would say when I, I put in anywhere from seven to 10 hours a day on the harp. And so that, you know, it's sort of like the violin or the piano or, you know, it's very digital. It's very, um, uh, there's a, a huge muscular element and it's, you know, getting those neurons and, and, and muscles all connected up and, you know, the decoding and the, you know, so what I am grateful for, I am so grateful for is that, you know, I did that kind of work with a lot of the repertoire in that time frame. So, you know, bringing any of these pieces up is, is not, terribly difficult at this point just physically so what I get to do now is sort of exist in that very cool creative space where I'm not I'm not worried about so much you know it's 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 difficult to to do anything no matter how well you you know it but um I can kind of exist in a in, in a different layer 
you know, where I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, what, what's really going on here? What, what, how can I do this? How can I shape this? What kind of volume spectrum can I work with here that maybe, maybe I didn't do before. Maybe I, maybe I can play that a little more quietly and still have it, um, project and yet give it a completely different atmosphere it's it's a fun process and of course every acoustic is different so one thing i really like to do is is you know go into the space wherever i'm playing whatever hall it is and um you know preferably on a concert day is my favorite thing to do is just go in there after lunch after the morning dress rehearsal with an orchestra and and i just i just kind of hang out on stage you know, I'll, I'll check my phone, I'll recline, I'll, you know, just kind of look around, look at the ceiling. It's like, wow, that is some ceiling. And, you know, check, just check the place out in a very relaxed way. And then just like really practice, not just like run through things, but just really feel like, you know, it's sort of like claiming the space, you know. Now, that's not always possible. But when it is, I feel like it's a really good way to... Um, uh to to work with music with that with whatever acoustic you've got because you know the acoustic especially with an instrument like a harp that that um you know i have to one of my big priorities whenever i perform especially with an orchestra is, is projection you know i've got to figure out how how you know pingy a space is you know is that pop i'm gonna like put somebody's eye out in this hall or do i really need to like dig in yeah. and um i also now have a a, a microphone jack okay. in my harp wow. which um it gives me a, and an amp um that gives me a ton more control over you know i can you know like like we were saying we're all becoming recording engineers yeah, yeah. i can control the balance and the treble and the you know bring up what i think a certain acoustic uh might require so i don't know it's, it's just when you've been doing this as long as i have you've got all your little comfort routines and you know it, it's kind of fun mm -hmm. you know i i work with young i i teach in two conservatories mm -hmm. so i'm working a lot of the time with you know young talented students who are just just beginning mm -hmm. and so it's kind of fun to be able to you know share some of these routines and help folks kind of cut to the chase i mean everybody gets their own routines mm -hmm. that work for them but um you know it's sort of like uh being able to <laughs> give out little secrets yeah, yeah. and uh you know give people there aren't too many shortcuts in life but sometimes if if you get some good info early on that can feel like a shortcut you know Cool. Uh, well, uh, your fans, your followers know uh, so many things about you musically. Uh, is there something that you think they might not know, but you're willing to share with us? <laughs> oh boy, that's a that's a Pandora's box. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, gosh, that's that's a good question. Um, it, you know, I think particularly for women. Who do this i mean there there are not an awful lot of um i think female soloists mm -hmm. like orchestral soloists and people who tour and you know that kind of thing who do this a long time um you know just because the balancing act is really really something um i have a daughter and i just you know i love her dearly she's in fact graduating from high school during this very strange strange time um uh graduating virtually i should say um and you know balancing all the components of life sometimes i do feel sort of like i have about you know six different personas depending on the you know, the situation, but, um, you know, I think, I think that that part of me, the, the priority balancer, um, is, is, is maybe something that for either concert goers or people that may like my recordings or, you know, however they, they know me, um, that balancing act would probably shed a little bit of different light on me as a as a person than you know might be readily a, a apparent you know i i would say i'm a pretty 
both a solitary and a, a fairly goofy person. So, so uh, you know, my various com compartments don't always blend. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's it, it's often kind of interesting when somebody picks me up at the airport when I'm you know going on tour because you know that one just has to sort of pull themselves together to walk on stage at least reason reasonably so and um you know i uh i'll get off a plane and people will usually not recognize me they'll be holding the sign you know yolanda condonassis yeah. and looking around it's like you know that's getting it's getting less um less of a disparity uh but when i was younger boy i'd get off the plane with you know glasses and a messy bun and a you know jeans jacket and sneakers and no one would know who in the world i was but you know i guess there's a part of me that kind of likes that because um you know no matter what we do no matter how we have to clean up to to you know do whatever it is we do in the you know its most refined form um you know, we go to, you know, we go home with ourselves and we look at ourselves in the mirror and we have to feel that who we are is someone that is, it is authentic and um, doesn't take themselves too seriously. Because I think whenever any kind of a performance field you're in, whether, you know, anything in entertainment, I think it's real easy to start you know, believe in your press releases and believe in your reviews. And, you know, there are always going to be people telling you you're the greatest. And I think you have to, you know, you have to have a decent self-esteem mm -hmm. to, to do this. But at the same time, you need to pretty much remember you're just, you know, just who you are, yeah. whatever that is. And um, accept it and try and make it a little better every day if you can. But um yeah i think uh you know that's a long answer to a question i'm not even sure i answered it it, but, it was uh, great it was great <laughs> uh, actually I don't know. another tough question i've been asking my guests and uh the the past a couple of guests have said oh can i can i share two moments because personal and musical are different so a life-changing moment you could say a musical life-changing moment and a personal life-changing moment hmm um Boy, those are very good. I, I, I can certainly cite my personal life changing moment, which would probably just be the birth of my daughter. Okay. Um, that changes everything. Um, and, uh, you know, no matter how important what you do is, and it's always, um, you know, I have a, a poster that I keep up in both of my studios and it's sort of my little mantra for all my students that, you know, excellence isn't a result it's a habit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to go about everything we do in our lives with, you know, do the best we can, because what whatever our best is, that becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very hard to separate and say, I'm going to do a crummy job of this. But you know, boy, this I'm really gonna, you know, sometimes we have to, you know, push and pull. But once you have um, a child, I think you just the entire world takes on a completely different uh, color. Um, and, you know, being responsible for that sweet little thing from that, you know, morning when she arrived at 9am on her due date, um, in, uh, you know, in 2002, um, that, that was, that was life changing. I mean, prior to that, I'd had a lot of moments I thought were life changing, you know, big concerts or big, you know, competition or, you know, all of that kind of comes and goes. But once you're responsible for another human, you know, that's, uh, that's life changing. Yeah. But um, uh, professionally, gosh, um, life changing. I mean, there's so many little, little moments along the way that add up to, mm -hmm. you know, sort of big moments together. But um, you know, maybe I would say it happened. One of them, there have been a few, but one of them probably happened when I was in high school at uh, Interlochen Arts Academy, which in of itself was kind of a life changing experience. Mm -hmm. That four years of high school that I had there, and 
you know, like so many instrumentalists, you know, I started young. My mother was a piano teacher. I played the piano. I played the harp. I, I read music probably before I read words. I'd been doing it, you know, my whole life. So, you know, so many kids like me get an awful lot of uh, sort of positive feedback. Oh, you're great. You're great. You're great. You're prodigy, blah, 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 blah. But, um, you know, and so I think it's real easy to go along and think, you know, I got this, I got, you know, uh, I, I got this covered. But I remember I made a, a tape, um, well, back in the days when we called them tapes. Um, we made a tape, I made a tape for uh, some sort of audition. I can't quite honestly, I can't even remember what it was. Um, and I, I listened to it. I did it in one or two takes and I thought, well, you know, no sweat. Um, and I listened to it and I remember thinking um, that, uh, boy, this is absolutely not the way I want to sound. It was, it was pretty, um, pretty one dimensional. And I, I, you know, I think it was, you know, we did not tape ourselves back then in the way kids videotape. And, you know, I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Everybody has the chance to stand back and look at themselves and listen to themselves. I almost wish people would listen a little more than they look <laughs> a lot these days. But, uh, you know, when it comes to music, at least. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we didn't do that all that much. And I feel like that moment was like a huge aha moment in terms of deciding, you know, what do I, what do, what do I want the hallmarks of my sound, my musicianship, my, my offering to the world? What can I maybe do, you know, better than some other things that I do? What are my strong suits? What, what do I want to be my strong suits? You know, one thing I have my students do sometimes is, um, you know, if they're struggling with that idea of finding their voice as a musician, I have them write a review. And I, I tell them, don't be modest. This is the review. This is the review of your dreams. Everything you hope and wish somebody out there who is a really astute, educated, refined, listening person would appreciate mm -hmm. in your playing. I want you to write that review. It needs to be a rave. And, you know, very often one can walk into their vision if they know what it is, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, uh, you know, and I think that for me professionally, even though that was so many years ago, it, it, uh, it, it, it was like it built in, um, that idea of, well, you think you're done. I, I, everybody calls me yo. So once in a while I talk to myself and say, you think you're done, yo, you're, you're not done. Um, you know, there's more to do here. So don't, don't, don't be feeling too good about yeah, yourself. Yeah, just. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, changing gears a little bit. I want to know what your playlist looks like other than classical music. Anything <clears> you can <throat> listen to that's not classical? Oh, yeah. I am a big music fan of, of in fact, very rarely. I do listen to string quartets um, okay. when I'm when I'm working, particularly. Uh, I don't know what it is about the string quartet sound that just it just kind of focuses my brain. But um, uh Oh God, I'm kind of, I'm a little bit of a dinosaur. I like the, I like the stuff I kind of grew up with. I love Queen and Earth, Wind and Fire and, you know, Chicago and Al Jarreau and, you know, all the sort of the R and B and, um, you know, uh, Aerosmith. I, <laughs> as I was saying, I, I, you know, I, I know I'll probably get some, some heat for some of the groups that I like, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I've always used music as kind of a, a mood uh, manipulator. Huh. Um, and I think I'm at the point where I have my favorite classical music that I find it, it's kind of a, 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 it's a transcendent thing. When I listen to classical music, that is my favorite stuff that I know will just take my psyche to a little bit of a, a higher level if I need that, uh, which we do, we sure do yeah. these days. But um, um, it's that other stuff that just, you know, I guess any music that we grow up with, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's like a, it's like time travel. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we sort of, I find that I 
corral that same energy that I had when I was 22 if I hear a song that I listened to on a tape loop when I was 22. You know, it just, it sort of, it, it sort of conjures that. And, you know, one thing I worry about these days is that, um, you know, for people of my age, you know, we have our, our, our anthems, you know, our, our songs that we all listen to. We knew inside and out, we knew the words and we remember, you know, driving through the mountains at some music festival with the windows down with, you know, music of, you know, a certain kind cranked up and, you know, we had that in common. And I feel that now the choices are so great. And I, you know, I see the kind of playlist my daughter uh, listens to, you know, with the, the you might also like part of it all that, you know, she doesn't even know who or what she's listening to all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just a playlist that was suggested for her. She likes it mm -hmm. and it's well curated and the, you know, the technology is amazing, but I'm, I just feel like the, the common experience is, is not as potent Same. as it, as it used to be, whether it's personalities, whether it's movies, whether it's, you know, which is why as horrible, as horrible as this COVID-19 thing is, as horrible as it all is, you know, we were watching um, graduation address uh, on, on TV the other day and talking about how this is, this is a challenge like this generation has never seen, but class of 2020 will have a common experience, a universally common experience that, that is, is getting less and less um, common. So, um, you know, I guess there's something to embrace in that. Mm -hmm. you know, when, when you're 45 years old and discover somebody else is the class of 2020, you're gonna say, oh gosh, do you remember that? Oh, and stories will be shared. And, you know, it's, it's so I think, I, I I lament the diminishing of common experience in the world. It's just, you know, I guess a casualty of technology and what we've got going on here. A couple more questions. Uh, do you still play piano? I do once in a while. I do once in a while. Um, it's it's sort of like, uh, you know, it, it, it's another um, uh, comforting muscle, sort of like writing for me that I will, uh, sit down and do sometimes. Um, we, uh, sadly, we need to get our piano tuned very much. I've, I've sort of been shying away from it because our piano desperately needs to be tuned. But, um, when we do that, maybe I'll, I'll do it a little bit more, but, um, it's there. Yeah. Um, you've done so many projects, worked with so many conductors, musicians. Is there one project, a composer, a musician, an orchestra, something that you just have in the back of your mind? You're like, I really, really want to do that. And it's never happened. You're, you're willing to share with us. Wow. Um, you know, I guess I, you know, one is at that phase where you, you think to yourself, you know, what, what is there I'd still like to do? Um, there's always stuff one wants to do. I would say that the the projects that I'm really zeroing in on now are those passion projects. You know, I've played with probably hundreds of orchestras. I've, you know, gone to, I've traveled to just about all the places I'd love to go. Um, you know, I've made, I don't know, 23 or four recordings, gotten to record a lot of stuff that means a lot to me. Um, there's not much repertoire. I feel like, um, you know, I'd still like to, to ca at least standard repertoire that I'd like to capture. I think, you know, where my real passion lies right now is in um, uh, almost combining my passions into sort of a cohesive whole, which, you know, combining that earth conservation cause with, with music and um, perhaps trying to add up the parts of my life and my interests into a sum that is maybe a little greater than, you know, any of those parts might be alone.
at least in my in you know in my little realm mm -hmm. but um uh yeah i think that's where my excitement lies right now in terms of the you know the next chapter of things um and you know if there's one place in a place i'd really love to go back to it would be new zealand i did a did a long tour a uh, chamber music tour with chamber music new zealand um and somehow you know since i did that we we played 13 i think 13 concerts in every every uh major city in new zealand and i, I you know when i think of sort of like a, a happy place i think back to that that tour and that um those settings and the people there and the appreciation of music and yet the down to earthness and you know um uh i i would love to go back there sometime and and do some playing maybe with one of these projects cool. that would be fun but um yeah i don't know i'm i'm kind of at peace i think mm -hmm. i've i've done a lot of stuff that i'd kind of hope to do mm -hmm. Uh, last question, and I, you already gave a lot of advice to young musicians in all your answers, but uh, advice to young musicians. Um, I would say that at this point, I mean, people are getting a lot of advice from a lot of good advice from a lot of places, but I would say that the thing that I, I most frequently need to remind people is that you can learn a lot from those who came before you. Um, uh, and, you know, again, I think it's, I think it's just a byproduct of the Spotify's and the, you know, the YouTube's and that kind of thing. Unbelievable wealth of knowledge to be found from music that is not on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, when you just sit there with your own self, a score and a, and a set of headphones in a, in a library, and and listen and study and you know it's that sort of um introspective solitary study of those who have come before i think that we really you know that we really learn we really learn what we want to be we may learn what we don't want to do mm -hmm. too but it is um you know just as true in the field of arts as anything else that you know those who don't learn from history um, are sort of doomed to repeat it. And that would only apply to the things that don't work. But there are a lot of things that do work and can be built upon. But I think one cannot possibly know if they are original uh, musically, interpretively, or any other way, unless they are pretty sure and have studied those who came before them and know that somebody else didn't already do that and maybe quite a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so when you're when you're trying to step outside the box, um, it's important to know if somebody else might have <laughs> same way some other time. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> anything else you'd like to add before we end? Well, you're a great interviewer. I love I love interviews when when, you know, the questions are good, but it just feels like a conversation. So yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. You too. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.